Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll begin in about a minute if you'd move to your seats. Got lots of seats over on this side. <clears throat> okay, let's begin. I'd like to welcome you to uh, this afternoon's panel. My name is Bob Wood. I'm the Executive Vice President of FCA International, and on behalf of FCA International and USNI, I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's panel. We'll, we'll be talking about a question, are we ready to fight and win in a fully contested zone? Uh, it builds certainly on the, what we heard this morning uh, from the service chiefs and their description. Actually, it started even before that. We had a kind of a breakfast meeting this morning with the, the N8, um, Adam Kreitz, and talked about what's been submitted, what's been expected, and we'll see how it all plays out in the in the PB, but I'm telling you, what you have in front of you now are some very important operators with the experience, but also the responsibility to contest in that zone. We're going to be led in this discussion by uh, a leader you probably all know well. Uh, we have uh, Admiral, I want to say Scott Swift, but I'll call him not so Swift because I, I just think it's the best name I've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Admiral Swift uh, certainly was, we know, as a, the commander, prior commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet. I first met him uh, when he was director of the Navy staff. And in fact, uh, Pete Daly and myself went and visited the director of the Navy staff and talked about this event and where it fit in the dialogue important to the maritime force. Uh, got some great guidance, good support. Uh, and really, we moved out, moved out from there in a way that I think has benefited this audience and these commands in a way that's really added to the combat capability and the readiness of the maritime force. And so it's great to have Admiral Swift as our moderator. He had numerous operational assignments, uh, attack squadron commands, uh, carrier, carrier commands, carrier strike group commands, and commander U.S. 7th Fleet, and a variety of staff positions in education, acquisition, operations, in the, op the Navy staff, OSD, and in PACOM, where he was Commander 7th Fleet. He's a thinker on the strategic level, and we talked over lunch about some of the things we heard, a correction this morning, after the presentation with the service chiefs, and I think he's going to take this discussion in a way that I think you'll find extremely informative, beneficial, and directly on our task of as answering the question, are we ready to fight and win in a fully contested zone? with a great supporting cast here to answer that question. Ladies and gentlemen, you got microphones spotted around here. Think of your questions. I can guarantee you they want to hear as much from you as you want to hear from them. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Pound. So uh, thanks for the, uh, the interdic interdic introduction, Bob. I, I will say that uh, I do recall that discussion that we had in in the office there in the in the Pentagon, and I was thinking back the last uh, FCA West uh, that I came to, and uh, and it's extraordinary. I think it was only about two years ago. It's extraordinary to walk around uh, the floor today and see all that's going on. It's almost too much. Uh, you just can't take it all all in as uh, as one uh, individual. So what I, I hope. Uh, that you were able to take in uh, Admiral Moran's panel uh, this morning that talked specifically about readiness. And, and what I'd like to do is, is to separate that discussion from this discussion. Bob al already reminded you uh, about what this panel is about. It's about finding it and winning in a fully contested zone. But if, if, if you look beneath that in the, in the description, 
it talks about how, how do we think, plan, and act in a way that uh, will ensure the success, the ability to, to win, uh, to fight and win and sustain ourselves in that, uh, in that contested zone. And I, th I think the key to that, it, both the time that I've spent uh, in the Navy and as uh, the year and a half that I've been out of the Navy, the things that I've been, uh, I've been doing, um, I think it's critically important that uh, we think strategically, uh, we plan operationally, and we act tactically. And what I've found is, is that uh, my experience has been, not just in the military, but in industry and elsewhere, other things that, that I've done, uh, that we, d we end up uh, thinking tactically, planning tactically, and acting tactically, and wonder why we can't get ahead. Uh, in the concepts and the application of those concepts. So I'd remind the audience, I'm going to run through introductions here uh, uh, shortly, that we have uh, some strategic thinkers on the panel here. Um, I would invite you to look at your uh, uh, program to read their bios in detail, but I'm going to touch uh, quickly uh, to remind the audience of uh, the unique warfighting experience that's represented uh, on this panel, uh, and the fact that they are living and operating at the operational level. Uh, and so they, that thinking strategic, planning operationally, and acting tactically is in their daily job jar. Uh, so th I'm gonna, the first two questions, I'm gonna ask them now and let you think about them as I run through the, uh, uh, through the, the introductions. And the first one, let's answer the question up front. Uh, are we ready to fight and win in a, in a fully contested zone? And it's, it's a complicated question, it's a complicated problem, and it's a complicated answer. So I'm curious to see how the panelists uh, answer that question based on their, their own experiences. Uh, and the second question is, answer the question about what a fully contested zone. So if you look at Admiral White's world, uh, his perspective of a fully contested zone may be very different uh, than Admiral Fagan's world and where she has been in, in uh, leading uh, for some time now. And I'm sure very different from Admiral Sawyer's world as, as the N3. So with that, let me, uh, let me run through some, some introductions uh, quickly here. I, I mentioned uh, Vice Admiral Fagan already. She's the uh, uh, commander of uh, Coast Guard Pacific Area. I didn't have a clue what the Coast Guard Pacific Area was uh, despite having grown up on the West Coast. Uh, both uh, in my childhood here in San Diego and all my uh, Navy career has uh, been on the West Coast um, until I w was the J3 at, uh, at PACOM. So her responsibility runs from the Rocky Mountains uh, all the way west to the uh, east coast of the uh, uh, African uh, continent and from the North Pole uh, to the South Pole. So a, 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 sig a significant area uh, to be concerned about across phase zero and phase two operations. So she and her forces uh, are engaged in a daily basis. She concurrently serves as the commander of uh, Defense Force West and provides Coast Guard mission support to the Department of Defense and combatant commanders. So uh, she may not be multi-hatted, but uh, there are a lot of hats that she answers to of senior people who think that she works for them. <laughs> She served on all seven continents, so you talk about diversity of experience uh, from Antarctica uh, to the heart of Africa and from Tokyo to Geneva. Uh, so a, a great uh, a span of experience to bring to the panel uh, this morning. Uh, Phil Sawyer uh, was an uh, operational commander, um, and now he's uh, living the dream of working in the Pentagon, and at least anybody used to be my, my deputy at PAC Fleet where I actually ran the fleet. So I'm gonna take uh, great pleasure and mercilessly uh, beating him about the head and shoulders throughout the panel uh, today. His first tour in the Pentagon. So if you feel any sympathy for him uh, <laughs> serving there now, you can go ahead and wipe that out of, uh, out of your thoughts. Career submariner, he served as Task Force uh, 74 and 54 commanding forces both in 7th Fleet and 5th Fleet. Uh, Commander Submarine Force Pacific, Deputy Commander of the Pacific Fleet, most recently uh, the Commander of 7th Fleet, and now is the uh, N35 on the OPNAV staff, 
uh, looking across on behalf of the CNO Naval Operations uh, around the world. Uh, Lieutenant General Osterman uh, comes with us with a, a wealth of experience. Infantry officers commanded at every level from platoon to a Marine Expeditionary Force. Uh, general officer assignments include assistant division uh, commander for both the 1st and 2nd Marine Division, commanding general 1st Marine Division forward in Afghanistan, deputy chief of staff operations for ISAF Joint Command in Afghanistan, commanding general of MARSOC, deputy commanding general of SOCOM, and his current assignment is the commanding general of uh, one MEF uh, just up the coast here in Camp Pendleton. So every uh, commander that you see up here on the panel has been involved in some form or fashion in combat operations. Uh, I would suggest uh, none more than Jody, and he brings a wealth of experience of the direct application in a war fighting environment in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, to the concepts that uh, if you've read the Commandant's uh, planning guidance and the Commandant's intent, brings those lessons into the uh, Pacific uh, theater here. Mentioned TJ, I, I told TJ that his introduction would probably be the longest here just because I think it's wicked cool that he served in USS Missouri um, <laughs> as an electronics warfare officer and uh, combat information center officer and assistant operations officer as a SWO and then made the transition to cryptologist. And I think that's extremely important for uh, the cyber warriors that are out there uh, to recognize the experience that they bring as true war fighters. TJ's got a, a leg up of, of uh, his experience there in, uh, in Missouri. Um, he was, uh, became a uh, cryptological warfare officer in 1992, assigned to operations directorate in uh, the National Security Agency, so out of the frying pan and, and into the fire. Operation fleet tours include assistant cryptologist, commander U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, U.S. Fifth, Fifth Fleet, assistant chief of staff for information operations, uh, N-39 and 7th Fleet, commanded the Naval Security Group activity in Bahrain and the Navy Information uh, Operations Center. Flag assignments include deputy director of uh, tailored, operation, tailored access operations and NSA. He's got a fascinating story. He's gonna regale us with that experience here today. Uh, Director of Intelligence, J-2, uh, U.S. Uh, Pacific Command, Commander Cyber National Mission Force, uh, U.S. Cyber Command, and currently commands the U.S. Fleet Cyber Command, uh, U.S. Uh, Tent Fleet. Um, just an example of the kind of experience that we're getting. And, and to round out this group, uh, Admiral Khan uh, commanded at every level uh, within uh, naval aviation from the Scott Squadron all the way up to the strike group level. Um, he also commanded the Naval Aviation uh, War Fighting Development Center in, in uh, Fallon, Nevada, uh, Nautic, uh, commanded Carrier Strike Group 4, was a director of air warfare, and then brought that experience of funding readiness uh, to his current assignment of uh, commanding uh, Third Fleet and the responsibility that goes with that from certifying forces deploying forward as well as uh, commanding uh, forces uh, going forward. So with those introductions, uh, we'll start at the end, TJ, since you're down there to this question of, are we ready to fight and win in a fully uh, contested zone? And for the audience, we had a, a quick discussion about the first two questions. Really wasn't interested in, in uh, you know, a broad discussion. We could spend the whole time we have here answering that question, but just kind of a snapshot view in answering that question from each one of these leaders. So TJ. Sir, thank you very much uh, for the very kind words and introduction. I see some uh, friendly faces in the audience, most of them from uh, coalition and partner navies. So everyone else, uh, please just hold your questions till the end. Uh, we're ready. Uh, it's a pretty direct question. I think it's a pretty short answer. Uh, in the cyberspace business, in the space business, uh, which I'm increasingly familiar with, uh, we are in the fight every day. Uh, if I was uh, to offer you a fires and maneuver term, I would say that we are danger close uh, and in continuous contact. Uh, you can read the headlines as well as I can. I can tell you it's very dynamic, it's very fast paced. Uh, it is sometimes difficult to get to attribution, uh, but that is the expectation. Uh, the adversary is swift. Um, we have the capacity and capability to be swifter. Uh, I think from a maneuver standpoint and an operational standpoint, uh, we have very good insight uh, because of our partnership with industry and academia, uh, but also across all the services in the intelligence community. Uh, I think uh, we are also seeing some progress on the policy front uh, as well. I think that uh, in the last uh, 
uh, several months, we have seen uh, the expectation uh, for cyber forces, for the DOD uh, to support and be engaged in something which we call uh, persistent engagement uh, out of U.S. Cyber Command, uh, to be ready, to be present, to be forward, to be postured, to understand what the enemy and the adversary are doing to us, where they are doing it, how they are doing it, uh, and then partnering as appropriate uh, with all sorts of uh, activities below the level of armed conflict uh, to engage. Uh, I would say we're still a little uncomfortable talking about it in public. Uh, and I think that that's okay for now. Uh, there is plenty of oversight. There is plenty of transparency. There's a very rich dialogue that happens uh, within government uh, with the right levels across all branches of government. Uh, so I think that we're in pretty solid ground. But we can't afford to be static, however. And I think sometimes we get caught in funding profiles. Uh, the ICT industry is not that. Uh, it moves faster than any other segment of the DIB. Uh, the defense industrial base, it moves faster uh, plausibly than any other part of civil society because it is so open, it is an open standard, and everyone subscribes to it. Uh, so we in the department, uh, whether it's doing joint or uh, DOD-wide operations or in support of defense support to civil authority, uh, we are subject to a consumer market like no one else is. Uh, so uh, from concrete to code, uh, we have to move fast. Uh, and that is probably where uh, I would say if we needed to improve a thing, it could be that thing. Thanks, TJ. Linda? Thank you, Admiral. Um, so the short answer is yes. Um, but we need to be thinking differently and more dynamically about how our assets are being uh, used uh, across, across the theater. And in particular, when it comes to force packages, and I just think about uh, the deployments that we did this past summer, uh, with Bertoff and Stratton, uh, we had uh, UAS, Scan Eagle, on board Stratton, uh, and how we blend that force package and interoperate alongside our Navy, uh, Navy peers in a way uh, that uh, that is dynamic and different than how the adversary is uh, is able to to operate. I'd also argue we really need to continue to leverage uh, the interagency process and the other aspects of our government. Uh, that have resources to, uh, to, to bring to, to bear uh, across the fight. Um, partnerships, they look different in the Pacific, and there are a number of uh, key partner nations uh, hungry for engagement and, and interaction uh, with the U.S., with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, we have a number of peer Coast Guards uh, in the region, with Japan, Korea, uh, India, Malaysia, peer Coast Guards, and peer navies and self-defense forces uh, who look to uh, partner and engage uh, with uh, some of the authority and expertise that, that we bring as a, uh, as a Coast Guard force. And then other, uh, other partners in the region really at most basic are looking for just partnership and capacity to, uh, to enforce and ensure their own sovereignty in their exclusive uh, economic zones. But the, Short answer is yes, we're ready, but we need to be thinking differently and more dynamically about how we force package and how we position, uh, particularly in the gray zone, short of conflict. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Satan? Short answer is yes, but I think I need to open up the aperture a little bit because the guidance from my, from my boss, Commander of Pacific Fleet, his first priority is deter our adversaries, or as Admiral Davidson says, win without fighting. Uh, and how do I do that aspect of it? Is by certifying and generating forces, combat capable, lethal, naval, integrated forces that operate for it. And I look at where we are readiness wise, I'm not gonna get into the sp specifics, but I look at the work that Vice Admiral Brown has done uh, for our surface ships and we're leaving less and less redundancy at the pier. Ships are going out full up. When I look at the work that Vice Admiral Miller done, has done with the readiness of our aircraft, we're in a much better place. Now, truth be told, we should be because a lot of resources have been applied to it. But we're seeing those results in terms of combat, capable, lethal naval forces going forward. The other priority is assure our allies, partners, and friends that we stand together. If you look at the, the Pacific, it's a big place. From Hawaii to Manila is like flying from New York to LA and back to New York. That's a lot of sea space. And it's gonna be working with our coalition, our allies, our partners and friends. They're gonna play a big part in that. And it's also about we can surge all our forces, but we can't surge trust. 
and we have various exercises. Some are live, virtual, constructive, or synthetic, uh, that we work with our coalition partners so that we understand each other, we understand the capability they can bring to bear, and we're generating that trust out of every one of them. And the last one is if called, up, called upon, fight and win. That's what the American people expect us to do as part of the joint force. You know, I look back to my days uh, at Nautic and some of the training environments that we were able to create, create there, simulation environments, where you had young, trained, disciplined surface warfare officers talking with young, trained, disciplined naval aviators. You put those people in the right environment that's at a high-end level, and they start having conversations that I never had as a junior officer. I'm a firm believer from young minds come fresh ideas, and when you take those young, trained, disciplined warriors, you put them in that environment, they come up with ideas men and women over 40 aren't gonna think of. And we're about five, six years into this. Uh, so from a fight and win perspective at the tactical level, we are much better than we used to be. Room to grow, more work to do, but we got some fantastic lieutenants and JGs out there that are doing some good work. I think from a, uh, getting back to the Pacific, and that geography matters in a fully contested environment. We'll get into the definition here shortly, but I guess my view would be when in a multi-domain environment where ordinance is coming from us in a multi-domain manner and potentially ordinance coming at us from a multi-domain perspective, that would be my definition of a contested environment. Per perspective sometimes is where you sit or where you've sat. But to answer the question, yes, we are ready to fight and win tonight. Thanks, Shane. Phil? Yeah, thanks. Um, I do think the very short answer to this is, is yes, we are ready to fight and win. And as the other speakers have uh, kind of articulated, it's manning, training, equipping, uh, and our concepts for how, we'll go to f how, how we will go to fight. Uh, the important part, and again, it's been alluded to, is there's a temporal aspect to this. We are ready now, but the other guys are continuing to try to erode away at our advantage. And it's imperative on, on, on us and actually many of the folks out there that we continually stay ahead of that, both qualitatively and uh, to as much as possible a, 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 a quantitative uh, standpoint. And so uh, it, uh, it is that the CNO put out in his frago his three main tenets of war fighting, war fighters, and future fleet. And I think if you look at all three of those and take them in totality, it's, it shows that we are on the right path that supports in support of the national defense strategy, and it shows all the, the pieces and parts that are required to make sure that that we're following the North Star, the goalpost that is the national defense strategy, and we stay ahead. The last part that I would add, uh, and it's part of the warfighters aspect of it, is, uh, is the, the part about making sure that our people uh, not only are taken care of, critically important to the commanders, but also are absolutely best prepared to go do whatever it is our nation is going to ask us to do. And I think that there's a, a training part of that, clearly, but there's also an education uh, part of that. And I think we are just now seeing that we're, we're taking on the education portion of that. Thank you. Jody? Okay, sir, uh, first off, I'd like to amend my bio is that I have never served in the Pentagon, so <laughs> Phil, Phil may, took one for the team here on this last go around. But um, my, the answer for me is uh, yes, ready to fight and win also, uh, without a doubt. You know, the last uh, 18 to 20 years, essentially the Marine Corps has become a second land army because our nation asked us to do that. So fighting alongside the U.S. Army and very terrestrial based in terms of uh, our Afghanistan and Iraq mission sets. Um, I, I have to point out that we have transitioned from that. We are now back to our expeditionary routes, which is, allows us to get after the uh, near peer fight that uh, the defense planning guidance has uh, talked towards. So, you know, instead of being, um, you know, uh, a second land army that can also go on ships, we're now a naval force that can go ashore when required. And so a very distinct difference in uh, mindset and the way that that's all come about. Uh, that's been further refined with the uh, Commandant's Planning Guidance for anybody that hasn't read that. Uh, that is our way forward and it's what's gonna refine our ability to uh, not only 
currently win and fight, but also in the future to maintain the decisive edge. Because as Admiral Sawyer mentioned, uh, the enemy gets a vote. They get a chance to uh, get better, and we've got to stay that much better than they are. So uh, with uh, force design changes associated with that, naval integration, uh, for me personally, it's working with Admiral Khan and Third Fleet to uh, be tied at the hip on um, no longer the operational forces of the Marine Corps, but the fleet Marine forces, uh, back to our old nomenclature, which defines us as soldiers from the sea, which is exactly what we are in terms of the naval integration aspect. Um, I would say in terms of the uh, readiness to fight and win there, uh, oriented on the multi-domain fight that we'll probably talk about a little bit later. And uh, most importantly, as an expeditionary force, uh, being able to fight and win inside the, uh, the enemy's weapon engagement zone. So we fully expect to be within the range of those weapons that the enemy may bring to bear, uh, but being able to be that contact layer in order to allow the surge activity that's required, but long and short of it is to, uh, to win that complex fight. So back to being our uh, crisis response expeditionary force is capable of uh, responding immediately uh, against the nation's adversaries. So uh, a couple of thoughts run through my mind. Uh, one is uh, to Jody's uh, point of uh, fleet marine force. Um, I was fortunate enough when I was at the, uh, the PAC fleet commander to serve with some pretty in incredible leaders, uh, uh, Bob Brown uh, with uh, Army Pacific, uh, Shags O'Shaughnessy, Air Force Pacific, and, and General Berger uh, as MAR 4 pack And, and uh, we came up with a concept between the two of us of doing combined commander's conferences. And uh, so he, he brought in uh, the one MEF and the three MEF commander and the other principals, and he would do a MAR 4 pack commander's conference, and we would plan it to be adjacent to the PAC fleet commander's conference. And then we, we would, depending on the agenda, we'd do a day or a day and a half together. Uh, and we would host it in, in, uh, in, in my spaces, uh, what was my spaces at, at PAC Fleet. And as good hosts, you have the name tents. You know, that's the critical thing. I mean, your, your team's doing a great job here and making sure that we have all this right. So I had Mar 4 pack. And those damn Marines, you know, they, especially when there's Navy in the room, they go off on their own. They've got their own plan. And wouldn't you know that, uh, that General Berger would bring his own name tent? And there it was, General, General Berger, FMF PAC, to send a message to all those Marine commanders that reported to, he, to him that this was a naval force that we needed to, to bring together. Um, and then listening uh, this morning, once again, to General Berger, General Berger mentioned that this was a temporal question, as you mentioned, Phil, that it's not just counting numbers. It's not just beans and bullets. It's the experience that we have as war fighters and the fact that we can uh, delegate uh, authority and then I was struck by uh, CNO's uh, comments along that same context. So I think we're very blessed with the leaders that we have today, that the opportunity has presented itself, and you're seeing an aligning within the force that's fought, backed up by budget and is reflected in the comments uh, that were made here. Satan, you, you addressed the question already. I'll start with you, and then I'll run down to TJ and come back about um, like, you know, what exactly is this contested zone? You answered it already. Anything else to add to that? or? Uh, move off to TJ. Well, I think we all have to, um, particularly, and TJ, maybe you'll get it after this, um, electrons know no borders. And potential cyber effects leaving ships at pier where they can't even get in, into the fight. Um, so I think you have to think of some of these contested zones globally um, and be able to have the defensive system in place to be able to deal with that. Um, the only other thing that I would add, you know, I kind of talked at the tactical level with our various warfighting development centers. It's more than nautic and schmidtic. There's the undersea warfighting development center. There's the information warfighting development center, and and they're all they all are doing good work and and are moving out. But I also look at what CSG four and fifteen have done, and being able to create a training environment where you can stimulate training from the operational commander down to into level individual level operators. And I think that's very important in a contested environment, particularly in the way we're going to operate, integrated, and in some cases, interdependent. That you see something in training before you see it in combat. Because if you do not, you're going to pause or guess. And that's not the outcome we're looking for. So I, 
I'll stop there, sir. Yeah, thank, thanks, Satan. So, so TJ, to Admiral Khan's uh, comment, to riff off that a little bit, uh, the importance of uh, all domain fires, inbound and outbound, um, as you have thought through uh, your answer to this question, I'd, I'd be uh, grateful if you would uh, talk about the IWC concept and where you see it, that we've now got an IWC warfare commander that is resident within the strike group commanders, uh, commander staff uh, to look over that uh, domain of, of war fighting and how we're progressing there, but uh, over to you. Yes, sir, happy to do that. Uh, uh, and begging your indulgence, I'll probably give some preparatory remarks and then close with the IWC at the end uh, as sort of the capstone argument. So in the space that I occupy daily, uh, you know, space, uh, the high ground, cyberspace, the everywhere ground, I would say that that's kind of the fastest fight. There's something that seems a little ephemeral about that. Uh, Satan uh, and the other number of fleet commanders, uh, the integrated maritime force, uh, which is first MEF, third MEF uh, in the Pacific, you know, they require uh, that we connect and bind the fleet so that they can do effective uh, sustainment, that they can do effective and safe maneuver, so that they can do that with confidence uh, from underneath or outside uh, the enemy's time zone uh, or decision space uh, and sensor grid. So, so that's the fight that we are in uh, day in uh, and day out. We don't uh, have the luxury to fight tonight, uh, we think. Uh, we're in it today, so uh, we have a lot to learn. It seems to be a little transient, um, and I think that's part of the struggle we have, which points then to the establishment of the Information Warfare Commander afloat. So we've had uh, great success uh, at the strike group level. Um, one of the four warfare commanders reporting directly to the strike group commander. Uh, and I think that that's a program now in its fourth year, uh, post major command uh, 06s uh, across the Navy's information warfare community. Uh, they bring uh, with them 24 to 26 years of experience uh, in not only every facet of information warfare in the Navy, uh, but because a lot of them uh, by that juncture will have been fully joint qualified they're bringing a lot of experience with the joint force, which then gives them some pretty experienced aperture uh, in the all-domain fight. Uh, so it really is about how do you prepare and integrate with the strike group uh, in the OFRP, uh, and then how do you, you as a commander understand sometimes you are supported, sometimes, uh, well, you're always supporting, sometimes you're supported, uh, and then how do you enable the strike group commander uh, as part of DMO uh, to carry their fight as they see fit. Uh, I think we do, uh, understand that uh, space, you know, that's a, that's a large gravity well to get there and to be uh, effective. And it's gonna typically take uh, nation states, uh, not just to get there for things like communications, industry is very good at that, but to achieve effects in space, uh, you're likely talking nation states that are uh, in the wherewithal of doing that. So we need to understand what they're capable of. Uh, the information warfare commander uh, is to enable the strike group commander to do maneuver as he sees fit for his fight, uh, exercising mission command uh, with the O plan that uh, carries forward from the number fleet and the maritime component uh, and the Joint Force Commander. Thanks, TJ. Linda, as you uh, share you, your, your view on that uh, contested zone, it, it'd be interesting uh, to hear your thoughts on uh, what collaborative activities that your forces are conducting. I'm thinking of drift line fishing. Uh, collaborative efforts with the Chinese. So this isn't uh, all about confrontation. Um, it's really a competition, and a competition isn't necessarily a bad thing. Plus the things that you are doing uh, kinetically uh, in the theater as well. I just noticed the Coast Guard PC in San Diego Harbor the other day, first one I've seen in CONUS. Uh, seen they're all deployed over in, in Fifth Fleet and doing great work there. So it might be used to pull, expand a little bit on what your forces are doing yep, there as no, well. Yeah, absolutely. And so what I, where I want to go is um, regions where we should be, be looking, um, looking at for a force projection standpoint. And I would go to those regions where we've got someone who's projecting power that challenges international norms and rule of law, right? That, that's really where the, where the anchor is. Uh, needs needs to lie. From a Coast Guard perspective, we, we look beyond the, the defense role that the, our DOD counterparts want, and we look at it from a security and an economic uh, perspective as we look at what uh, what are contested uh, contested zones. So Eastern Pacific, uh, we did do an offload of the uh, the Monroe did a drug offload just uh, just three weeks ago. 
79 percent of the drug flow into North America is coming through the Eastern Pacific, uh, you know, off the coast of South America, uh, through the transit zone, into the arrival zone in, um, in Mexico. Cost to the economy, $193 billion in crime and health and safety and productivity loss to those narcotics that are coming towards our shore. And so, you know, TCOs are using that, uh, that vector to spread corruption and, and instability. And I would tell you for the Coast Guard, that is, we, we are conducting that mission now. It is a 365, 24-7. We are out there every day uh, looking to, to interdict and counter that security and economic uh, threat to the, to the United States. Uh, another area of, uh, of focus, the Arctic from a contested uh, area. Uh, $3 billion of economic impact to the Alaska seafood industry, 90 billion barrels of undiscovered oil, 30% of the world's natural gas in the Arctic, and estimates are a trillion dollars in uh, rare earth and minerals and uh, zinc, zinc, lead, et cetera. Polar Star, my first unit, then I will add it was not a new unit when I first reported to it uh, in the, in the mid-'80s, 44 years old and is uh, in route home port uh, from New Zealand as, as we speak. So as we look at the Arctic, the increasingly uh, open water in the Arctic, China's interest, having declared themselves as a near uh, Arctic state, Russia's interest, and as they have uh, built up and increased uh, their, their military presence on their side of the Arctic, uh, the polar security cutter then becomes critical to establishing on, wa on the water uh, you know, presence in in our uh, claims to the Arctic and our, ensuring our own uh, national uh, sovereignty. And then uh, to the Admiral's question with regard, you know, so collaboration, that is, that is one of the things that the U.S. Coast Guard does exceptionally well. Uh, there is a uh, forum, it's called the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum. Uh, there's a comparable one uh, in the North Atlantic. North Pacific Coast Guard Forum is comprised of Russia, China, Japan, Korea, Canada and the United States. As a Coast Guard, we, we have and continue to have a dialogue uh, between the U.S. Coast Guard and China Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard and Russia Border Guard, talking about shared interests, search and rescue, uh, maritime uh, boundary challenges uh, in, in the bearing, and particularly with China, the, the challenge of uh, illegal and unregulated uh, fishing, which is rampant uh, in the Pacific. And there are, uh, a number, a number of, of countries who are um, uh, particularly uh, guilty, uh, guilty of that. But so having that collaborative uh, system, an ability to, uh, to 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 talk through the problem set has been uh, been been really key uh, in and important to us. So um, so finally, just again, those those areas where we can offer a uh, a counterpoint. And then, you know, in some of the smaller Pacific Island nations, and this, this, as I said earlier, this is about then capacity and uh, expertise and to, to ensure that they're able to enforce their own uh, sovereignty in their exclusive economic zones. For many of these small countries, you know, this is, it's kind of an existential reality for them. The fish stocks and fish proteins really uh, provide security uh, for, uh, for, for each of these, these nations. But you know, com in the short of conflict, competitive space where uh, where partnership and expertise and engagement and um, you know the the rule of law is based open order is uh, really how how we view the, uh, the the Pacific region. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Contested zone. Yeah, contested zone. So I think it's. Uh, uh, very helpful to have the, the, the speakers who just talked because I'm going to leverage off of a little bit of them. So first of all, it's all domains, right? Space, cyber, and, and all the things that we normally think of uh, from, a, from a military standpoint, from a kinetic standpoint. Uh, but the other interesting part, I think, uh, is that there are different phases of the conflict, if you will, that's going on in all these different domains uh, at the same time. As, uh, as Linda just mentioned, you know, if you're a Pacific Island nation out there, security is number one. Uh, your, your fishing stocks, your proteins, hugely important. And, and you think you're in something what we would term greater than phase zero, so phase zero plus. We might not see it that way. But, uh, but that's the, the important part about the way I think 
uh, what fully contested means, and that is uh, all domains, different phases in different areas. And, I, and the other part that I think is relatively new, um, and new being you know a past decade or so, uh, is that it's there's not the same kind of geographic constraints that we in the past kind of thought of when we start talking about conflict, and that's because of cyber and space. All right, I can be uh, you know somebody in uh, in a place in a in a continent way far away and have an impact on an electrical grid. Uh, or a banking system, or the variety of things uh, that we know uh, that we've seen it have occurred. Um, uh, and then the last part from the purely the kind of the other military perspective that I think of is when we talk about contested zones, in my mind what that conjures up is that uh, every inch of ground or sea that I'm going to have to uh, move into uh, it's going to be contested. There are going to be, there's going to be something or somebody there that's going to try to keep me away from that. I am not going to have initially the superiority and certainly not the dominance that I desire and certainly not the superiority or the dominance that perhaps our recent past has, has shown us that we would have in some aspects of a fight. And so I think that makes it completely different than our, our most recent experience and thus the importance of the great power competition and making sure we're keeping our eye on that ball uh, as we move forward. Thanks. Jordan? Okay. Hey, funny thing is, and it's a really good news story, is that almost had the exact same things written down as Admiral Sawyer had. Uh, and just to expand on those a little bit, the multi-domain fight in, in different phases is really something I've been driving home with the MEF because, you know, where you may be in a uh, a phase zero, you're not in any physical contact with somebody. I mean, and even today, we're, we're in phase three with some of our adversaries in the cyber domain. I mean, we're duking it out every single day. So it's one of those things of trying to get, in my case, the Marines to understand they can be in different places, in different domains, all at the same time. And, uh, and that really is uh, uh, a kind of a change in the way that we've been thinking. And to the point about the uh, global aspect, if you look at the defense planning guidance and the two plus three aspect of it, long and short of it is if we get uh, you know, into a conflict type situation associated with Russia or China, uh, you're liable to have somebody else there that's gonna try and be an opportunist on the backside of that. So as a Marine Corps, we're looking at uh, not only having conflict, but then also simultaneous competition elsewhere as somebody tries to take advantage of that. Um, to the, uh, to the point about uh, kind of a supremacy superiority aspect of it, as Admiral Sawyer touched on, you know, I, I really sincerely believe with our, with our near peer adversaries, they'll have roughly the same capacity, uh, roughly the same uh, capability, roughly the same lethality as we will. So the only thing that we're gonna have as a decisive advantage is gonna be that ability to get inside the OODA loop, and this was mentioned in an earlier uh, briefing as well, but how quickly we can uh, get through that decision-making cycle because it feeds into that temporal nature of what this contested zone is all about. And frankly, you got to be acting quicker and be uh, more, uh, more capable in working in that environment to achieve superiority when you need it because, again, as mentioned, we won't have supremacy like we've had for most of the history of our nation, frankly. So a couple of thoughts as I've been uh, listening to the panelists, uh, and I think Admiral Kahn mentioned this, that it's important to, uh, to think globally. Uh, so while the focus of the fight may be regionally, we can't take our eye off, off broader conflicts that, that could occur uh, tangential to, to what the, the focus uh, might be, and that was uh, brought up uh, by CNO earlier this morning. Um, uh, Secretary Work talked about the importance of, of peer competitors out there, and, and near peer has has been a part of our vernacular for some time. And there are specific areas that you can say, yeah, we still have overmatch here, or overmatch there. But taken in total, my personal view is that China certainly is a is a peer competitor. And if you take this this context of uh, you know the other near peers that are out there, multiple. Uh, players from Russia to North Korea uh, to Iran and and uh, and others, um, they very well could take an opportunity with uh, the U.S. Uh, focused in one area, 
uh, to act out in other areas, which takes us to a point that Jody brought up, and I know this is uh, front and center in both the CNOs and, and Commandant's mind, and that is it's important to think asymmetrically and out of phase, that agility is key to winning a, a war fight with a peer competitor, and that agility comes from the ability to delegate authority, and that authority comes from a foundation of training and experience, and that we exercise that on a daily basis, which is uh, what I see in, in uh, the leadership uh, that these leaders are exercising on a daily basis. I was going to ask a question, and, and I'm going to answer it myself uh, in the interest of time. And, and Phil, I'm going to give you the last question, and because and, uh, I want to get to uh, the audience questions. I notice we only have a, a half hour left. So if people want to move to the microphones, it'll speed the process of, of stepping through the questions. And so, so we. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Admiral Moran had, uh, ran a, a readiness discussion, um, but with your experience of having already served successfully at this level, and now you're in the Pentagon, I get it, the, the three and the five level, you're not deeply steeped in the budget piece, um, and, and perhaps stepping into uh, Jody and, and Satan's area, you know, given the budget constraints that the CNO and the Commandant, both Commandants uh, spoke about, and the sophisticated systems that people tend to think in, that, that are necessary to win in this, in this war fight. Um, what, what's your sense as you sit in the, in the Pentagon about um, our ability to uh, make sure that we are aligned from a funding perspective to get after those things that uh, the ladies and gentlemen that, that relieve these commanders here and are facing the same challenge that our, your predecessor uh, faced. Before I get to that, the, the, the question that I was going to ask is, as a joint force, you know, what makes naval forces so unique? And I uh, was doing some studying and some of the other things that I, I've been doing and ran across a piece of data that I'd never seen before. And it was relevant to me as a retired naval officer and less than 1% of the Pacific is land. So the question, I think, amongst uh, strategic planner, strategic thinkers, uh, military strategic thinkers, and operational planners is where are we going to fight to? And then once we get there, how are we going to fight from that space, regardless of what domain it, it, it's in? And you see that throughout the Commandant's intent and the Commandant's planning guidance. You see it in SecNav's uh, uh, papers that, that he's been putting out, and you see it in uh, documents that uh, the CNO continues to publish. So Phil, from, from your perch there in the Pentagon, as you look at the budget uh, development, uh, what's your sense of you know, the, the, the OPNAV understanding where the fleet is and where we need to go in, in uh, building uh, the budgets that uh, presides, provides the resources to continue uh, the su success that we've enjoyed so far in the last year or so? Yeah, th thanks, I'm just, I'm the perfect guy to ask a question about the budget. I, I sincerely appreciate that one. Um, uh, and so uh, I think I, I'm going to answer your question from, from uh, this aspect, Admiral. Um, we have a national defense strategy, and strategy really is about choices. You have to be able to prioritize, and you have to figure out what is most important, and then just kind of work your way down. And though you may love something that, that ends up below the line, you have to make hard choices. And that means those things don't make the final cut, if you will. And so uh, it's, I think it's critically important that we have a North Star, the, the goalpost, to aim for. And that is our national defense strategy and focuses on our long-term strate strategic competitor being the PRC. And so with that, as kind of, uh, you know, where we're headed, it, it helps make, it helps the Pentagon uh, with support by all the fleets and everyone else that uh, is here to help on that. Um, it, it helps keep us grounded because we keep looking back to, okay, that's, that's where we're headed. You know, I heard the story, there's, uh, uh, there's a, uh, there's a plane that's flying and it gets a thunderstorm, right? And so the pilot diverts. Okay, well the thunderstorm makes you divert for a, a short period of time and then you get back on your course. So the world gets a vote, right? Things occur that may draw our attention away for a period of time, but, but once that thunderstorm's gone by, you gotta get back on the course. And so, uh, 
strategy requires choices, and, uh, and, I, and I feel very confident, uh, knowing what I do know in the short period of time I've been in the Pentagon, that, um, that the team's there, and it's a, it is a naval team. It's uh, the Marine Corps and the Navy are taking hard looks at across the board of what we, what we need for the future fleet and are providing the right amount of resources to that. Now, th there's always room for more, right? Uh, we never have enough, uh, but that said, given what we've got, we are making very, very tough choices, and I think uh, in the right direction. Thanks for that, Phil. All right, let's get to, uh, to questions. If, if uh, someone has a question, have some courage and step up uh, to the mic, and I would uh, just remind we've got a wealth of diverse experience up here in the panelists. Uh, so, uh, fire away. Yes, sir. I'd be interested in the panel's views, if you look in your crystal ball, say 10 years out, of the roles of new or extrapolations of existing technologies in how they will affect how we contest those contested spaces. Thinking about things like artificial intelligence, unmanned vehicles, hypersonic m missiles, uh, directed energy weapons, things that are today technologically and scientifically on the horizon but not yet really deployed. Do you see any of those making significant change 10 years out about how we do business? Anyone want to jump on that, sure. Jody? I'll jump on that. <coughs> um, you know, first to, uh, to mention when I talk about the Commandant's Planning Guidance, it is a 10-year mark. So it is actually a 10-year vision uh, for achieving that. From the technological perspective, uh, I'm a firm believer if you look at history, uh, as lethality increases, you have to disperse the forces further. You know, think of Civil War, you know, line battle, and it runs up against a machine gun in World War I, and if you don't disperse, you're gonna have incredible losses. So we're, we're in that mode right now, and I, I, so I think to the lethality of the weapons systems, we'll find it even more and more of a dispersed force out there, which challenge our, our command and control, our you know, survivability, our offensive capability, et cetera. Um, I think the one constant is the individual marine or sailor that's out there. And so probably see a requirement in the multi-domain aspect of having to invest more and more into that individual. Um, and I think from an AI perspective, uh, machine learning perspective, when you think about what I just talked about in terms of the decision cycle really coming down to being the deciding factor associated with you know, common capability, capacity, and lethality, decision cycle being it, that AI and machine learning will play very, very heavily into that. So I think that's uh, kind of where I would see that. The only adjunct I put on there is man and unmanned teaming. Um, you know, if I can get a, an unmanned aircraft to turn a 21G turn to take down somebody off of the rear end, you know, then all the better. But how do you get those man and unmanned teaming situations uh, where you can take them to advantage? Just a couple things. Um, one, I think we need to continue to look at resourcing the levels for our maritime operations centers. We're going to fight the high-end fight at the fleet level. And the maritime operation is center is the weapon system that the fleet commander uses to drive down actions down through the numbered fleets and into the individual tactical uh, units, task groups. Um, anything that, whether it's called the little loop, um, that can speed quicker decisions and more lethal actions, I'm all in. Anything that can provide overmatch. Overmatch that can drive simplicity down to the tactical level, I'm all in. Because I think the more complex you get tactics that you have, the more di difficult they are to pull off in the fog of war, particularly in a highly contested environment. Uh, I'm not gonna get into specifics what those type of overmatch capabilities are. Generally, I'd say better headlights, I wanna see further. All right, and as far as I can see, I want to shoot something. And once I make the decision and shoot it and pull the trigger or push the bottom, I want it dead now um, or hit now. So I think the speed matters. Uh, and when I think from a tactical CSG perspective, I think about operational reach. How far can I get away um, to be able to use maneuver on my terms to be able to put my capabilities in someone else's backyard? So that, that's where my mind is right now. TJ? Uh, just a couple of thoughts on that. I, um, I think uh, artificial intelligence, uh, 
you know, for the last 30 years, it's always been 10 years away. I don't know if it's going to be here 10 years from now, but it's going to be a lot closer. I don't think it's going to be necessarily fully instantiated yet in the way that we imagine it. I do think augmented human decision making uh, with some sort of compute and uh, analytic engine underpinning that is likely to be here in ways that we don't fully anticipate. And we ought to get ahead of that and thinking about uh, in the context of a more dispersed force uh, and Satan with some of your requirements to have better headlights, to have better lethal decisions, um, how we're going to empower uh, a force which might have to operate in a disconnected fashion or in isolation so that they can do the best decision making possible. Um, I think uh, you know, some of the uh, leaders up here have talked about uh, the value of young Marines and young sailors. Uh, they will come, I believe, with an ability to deal with ambiguity uh, with a little bit more comfort than we do uh, because of their access to data and the way that they will assimilate that uh, than I am currently able to do in my uh, advanced decision making. Uh, so how we, how we will empower them and be comfortable as leaders in giving them clarity uh, and also having some confidence with a little less control, not less command in the context of mission command, but a little less control. And that'll be, that'll be uncomfortable space uh, for leaders and decision makers to be in. Uh, one of my good colleagues, Steve Perode, uh, recently introduced me to a term which he used called the lethality boundary. Uh, and that's just basically where we as leaders will think we will be with uh, unmanned autonomous systems, uh, not just sensor platforms, but also armed, uh, and where we will insist uh, as society and as professional warfighters that the human decision maker is in the loop. And we probably could spend a little bit of time thinking more and more about that. And then last, uh, not to go on too long, uh, we do not currently have a good vision of just how much bandwidth we will require to do autonomous uh, over the leading edge warfighting. It's going to require a hell of a lot and a lot more than we're thinking about now. Bob? Well, while Bob's stepping up to the mic, what I, what I would uh, just offer a word of caution on technology is that uh, as I've thought more and more about this, I don't see, I see technology as an enabler, not as a solution. And invariably, when people bring technology into a dialogue with me, it usually has tactical implications. And my first thought is, how does this help my operational planning? And how do I think strategically about the application of this technology? So as, as you've heard these commanders discuss, uh, oftentimes it's a horizontal discussion. And I think it's really important to turn it into a vertical discussion about all domains and at the strategic, operational, and tactical levels. But Bob? Uh, perfect segue, sir. Uh, I wanted to talk in about space, uh, the contested domain of space, and I know that isn't necessarily the component that we see up here, but it's a requirement in that overmatch, it's a requirement in seeing over the horizon, it's a requirement in the operational agility of the maritime force, and I think of the Coast Guard, I mean, looking from where you go, from where you go, I mean, it's got to be something you worry about or think about. So it is contested, it went away today, just heard it's all gone. We don't have, we don't dominate there anymore. What does it mean to really lose dominance in space? What do you think about when you add space into your worries? So uh, the, the space world is moving fast. Uh, we actually have a space commander uh, uh, up here. TJ, you want to talk a little bit about where we are in yes, that domain from a Navy perspective and if you want to expand in the join as well. So as uh, the Naval component to uh, US Space Command, the nation's newest uh, combatant command, uh, I can tell you I am increasingly impressed with what they can do in space, a lot of which uh, I wasn't really aware of. Uh, the Navy role in that is largely as a uh, uh, operate some buses that are on orbit to provide uh, bandwidth and communications capability to not only the Navy Maritime Force but also the Joint Force. Uh, but as we become better integrated with the role in space and with what General Raymond is doing, uh, it is impressive uh, with what U.S. capabilities are and uh, allied capabilities are. Again, uh, the full spectrum of capabilities, uh, which you have to be pretty careful in talking about that. Uh, but what's not impressive, unfortunately, or I guess is equally impressive, is what other nations are able to do as well. Uh, it, is definitely, uh, it is definitely contested space. Um, so we are thinking hard about uh, what a new combatant command means 
what a new uniform service means, uh, what the demand for us will be. Uh, we have uh, a professional space cadre in the U.S. Navy. Uh, we probably will need to strengthen that and make it more resilient. I would be loath uh, to lose those billets and bodies and capabilities to another service, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's, it is yet as undecided. I do think, though, sir, um, uh, in a distributed force for distributed maritime operations to deliver what Satan requires for the strike group level, uh, it is going to begin uh, in space, and it's going to be uh, first mover advantage is, uh, is going to be key. Thanks, TJ. Uh, any questions? Good afternoon, uh, Lieutenant Commander Andrew Poulin uh, here in San Diego. Uh, my question, uh, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper in the role of allies and partners. I wonder if you could uh, speak to which allies and partners you see as critical to the fight, and more importantly, what steps are we taking uh, to kind of uh, ensure that high level of interoperability? So I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, this year is a rim pack year, rim of the Pacific exercise. We have uh, up to 29 partner nations participating. 1971, there were three. We have 29 partner nations uh, ready to pr participate this summer. That's over 40 ships, over 200 aircraft, about 25,000 people. That falls in my operating together, building relationships, generating trust with, and they're not all, they're all in the Pacific region, but some of them are from Chile. Um, and various nations uh, across the Pacific. Um, I was just came back from New Zealand two weeks ago where we had the Commander's Conference. Uh, and we had over 100 people in New Zealand, which is a pretty cool place if you can get there, um, <laughs> on a 12 hour flight from San Francisco to Auckland. Um, which speaks to the geography of the Pacific. Um, but we have exercises going on all the time. Um, but I just serve RIMPAC as one that's probably the most robust in the Pacific uh, from my vantage point. Linda? It, so um, I agree completely, you know, RIMPAC, something um, we as the U.S. Coast Guard uh, participate in. I mentioned a number of the, you know, key nations in the region where they've got, uh, you know, sort of, so for many countries, right, they may call it a navy, but they actually, they're functioning and their authorities are more comparable to the, to the U.S. Coast Guard, but, um, you know, a number of key peer partners in the region, Japan, um, Korea, uh, India, and a number of others. There's co there are other countries, and I'll use Indonesia as an example, who have a, um, are, are working to put together uh, their Coast Guard, a Coast Guard modeled on ours with the full suite of authorities and uh, capacity. And we uh, are, we've, we've Coast Guard members in and, in and out of Indonesia regularly to help uh, the Indonesians uh, build, build that capacity. But I, I point to another example where the, where the partnership really, really becomes, um, kind of comes to fruition we have um, 11, soon to be 13, bilaterals with, uh, with a number of countries in the region uh, in the realm of you know, these fish, fisheries, ship rider agreements, so Cook Islands, Kiribati, uh, RMI, FSM, Nauru, Palau, Samoa. Uh, another example of the kind of uh, you know, regular, sort of repeatable, predictable partnership and engagement that provides uh, value to, uh, to countries. We, um, uh, we are planning for some additional uh, deployments in, into the Pacific, uh, Blue Pacific uh, 2020, and one of the deployments will use our new fast response cutters and uh, the, some 225-foot buoy tenders to, to provide some, some capacity to the small island and partner uh, nations in a region uh, in a way that um, you know, is, is more uh, predictable. And I'm, I'm often reminded by, by my field commander in Hawaii that you know, in the region, a little bit that's enduring is much more significant than one big act and then you don't come back for, for five or six years. And so we're, we're working on um, you know, very targeted where we can make sure we are partnering uh, with, with the right, uh, you know, right, right set of uh, par partner nations. Thank you. So yeah. Phil, from the seven fleet perspective, pack fleet perspective, and now wearing the uh, N5 hat at OpMed as well. Yeah, so and I'll, I'll make this somewhat generic, um, but uh, 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 allies for us are indispensable. 
right? We're not, we're not going to war, we're not going to conflict without allies. We haven't done it in the past, we're not gonna do it in the future. Every ally or partner brings something different to us. Some bring us capacity, some bring us capability, some who may just go to RIMPAC and, and exercise bring us planners. All that matters, all of it's important, right? You stitch together the whole cloth to, uh, uh, to become as, as potent and as lethal as you possibly can. Uh, and, and I think that more and more from our, I'll say our, our long-term allies, we are, we're kind of getting past the point of being interoperable and moving to the idea of being interchangeable. And you will see this in the, in the, in the very near future when you see one of our strike groups operating with another uh, Navy ship for uh, not only COM2X, not only the training period, but throughout the deployment, right? So interoperable, that in my mind that's now, do I have the right communication gear to talk to the other communication gear and, uh, and do, I do I have the, the same pubs and crypto and all that stuff? But interchangeable uh, is really where we want to get. And we are, we are on that path to get there uh, with many of our allies. Yes, sir. Retired Sergeant Major, I'd like to talk about the nine dash line. And I realize that the Chinese Coast Guard is escorting their fishing boats along inside the nine dash line of, of Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, the Philippines. And uh, I'd like to know what the Coast Guard is going to do, if they are going to do anything. And I'd like to know about what the Navy's role is inside the nine dash line where Taiwan is located or any explanation you can give us about the nine dash line. Let me, let me I don't know who wants to take this on. I know, I know Lieutenant General Osterman does not need to do this, but uh, <laughs> the Coast Guard Thank or you. one of the other admirals <laughs> might be able to address the nine dash line. I defer to him. The, uh, <laughs> so Jody, any uh, comments <laughs> for, for the audience? The, uh, what, what I'd like to do is, is uh, recognize, first of all, that, that uh, the leaders up here aren't gonna make a decision about what they do with respect oh, to China. I but totally me, understand that. Let me answer the, uh, ask the, uh, the panelists to, to uh, answer the question in this way, and, and Linda, I would ask you to go first. First of all, uh, with your extensive background of understanding law of the sea, 